Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future, who call this place Aniskoyo, the land that Isla Vista sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship, mutual respect, and understanding. So this is the UCSB land acknowledgement, uh, which ties into what we're talking about today with activism. Um, and really for some context, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Um, why this is important is that the land for the all University of California um, colleges comes from Moral Land Grant, College Act of 1862, which was that all um, land grant colleges were funded by the sale of formerly native land. So in the, in, um, throughout the United States, the federal government through 162 violence back sessions, uh, experts created approximately 10.7 million acres of land from 245 tribal nations. And note, these are uh, like tribal nations that they would, um, that they would do deals with. There were lots of unrecognized tribes in these like violent takeovers. Um, and under each act, each state was eligible to receive 30,000 acres. Um, states were then given a script to sell the land, which granted them profits from the sale of these to fund their colleges and their states. So in 1866, the Union, um, the University of California was um, created basically on the land from these tribes, um, which I will, for now, I will say, and I will say them wrong, and I really apologize. Um, I know Hume, Wechia, Sukka, Kotopalenes, Chapasim, and Segwomni tribes. Uh, and these all came from 1851 session treaties. Um, today, there are more than 100 federally recognized tribes in California, and many more that are unrecognized. And in California, more than 700,000 Native people live here today. Um, on that note, I'm Eugene, I use he and pronouns. And my name is Thomas, I use he, they pronouns. And this is Strike Syllabus Week 7, entitled, We Want Education, Not Indoctrination, History of UC Activism. Do you want to talk about that quote at all, Eugene? Yeah, so this quote is from Robert Mason, um, who was part of the Black Student Union takeover of North Hall at UCSD. Um, which we will talk about later in this um, in this presentation, but I just thought it was like a great quote from a very like dynamic time in UCSB's history that really is showing one what we're doing here and two what like what UC activism is throughout history. So there we go. <laughs> to start, yeah, no. So just a quick kind of rundown, situating us a little bit where we've been in the strike syllabus, what we've been trying to do, we've tried to sort of shed light and raise consciousness about structural issues in California, the UC system, as it relates to the end of the world, vis-a-vis the global pandemic. Um, in the first half, we then moved on to talking about direct action as a way to start thinking about responses to some of these issues. And we looked in one space, or last week, about unions as one venue for organizing and affecting change. Now, we're looking at something much more immediate and much more local to our positionalities as members of the UC system, and that is UC student activism, which makes less um, sense as a slide now that we've had a title slide, you already know what the topic was, but that's where we are now. <laughs> um, so I want to start with this quote from Ruth Rosen, who was a graduate student and anti-war activist at UC Berkeley in 1967. Uh, in the 90s, she was approached about doing a documentary about her activism and then what, and participated in a piece that I link in this um, presentation about activism at Berkeley, and she talks about her feelings when she was approached first to make this film, and she said, I thought, is there anything I've done that I will be ashamed of when I'm an older person? And I realized I'm never going to be ashamed, or I'm never going to be embarrassed because I've never done anything I was ashamed of, which I thought was like a really kind of affirming and centering statement from someone who had an experience of activism and kind of fighting for a more just vision of the world that even 20, 30 years later, it was something she looked back on with integrity and pride, and something that I think we can all feel in our own activism. Something that we know, regardless of the outcome or how things are 
playing out globally. We're gonna be proud of the work we're doing here. So that's something I wanted to kind of start with. But student active, or student activists in the UC, people often associate with UC Berkeley in the 60s and early 70s. So it's like the Ruth Rosen quote I gave kind of indicated. That's for a number of reasons that I'm gonna speak on <laughs> in like not a lot of depth. Um, there's a free speech movement um, which started in 1964 that was like usually often characterized as kind of a more compared to later protests more kind of peaceful. Um, there are civil rights protests, Vietnam War protests were very sort of like renowned and something that Berkeley is very much associated with um, in part because of the kind of tactics and um, actions taken by protesters, but also because of the kind of violent and very visible response they received from politicians. Berkeley protesters were um, tear gassed and faced other kind of deployments of state violence um, as they were protesting. And part of this had to do with um, politicians such as Ronald Reagan, who decried the protests that were happening there um, and encouraged sort of violent police response. I'll probably talk about this more later, maybe even right now. But um, weeks and weeks ago, all the way back in, was it week three, when we talked about the UC stuff? Um, well, we talked about Ronald Reagan firing Charles Kerr as president of the UC, and part of that was in retaliation from Reagan um, because he was mad that Clark or that Kerr wasn't doing more to suppress protests on campus. Um, and it was actually something that had been ongoing. Um, the FBI director um, had been trying to discourage Kerr's uh, support of the protests. And so he kind of got in with Reagan while Reagan was campaigning. And this became a big talking point. And there's an article, again, I linked to the notes that's so about um, the ways in which Reagan's decrying of Berkeley activism became a sort of launching point for his political career. So these are some of the reasons, both the actual actions were taken by students, but also the kind of extreme response by politicians like Ronald Reagan, some of the reasons we associate activism in the UC with UC Berkeley activism. Do you have anything to add to those things, Eugene? No, just if um, if you take a look at the slideshow, we have some specific notes in uh, for this slide about those movements, if you wanted to go more in depth for your own classes or for your own research. That was excellent, yeah. Thomas, thanks. Yeah, no, there's some really cool resources about it, and honestly, so much happened in that period. Um, but as much as this was very much a prominent sort of site of activism, a lot of important things happened there, student activism is tied to history of UC across the campuses. It wasn't only a Berkeley phenomenon. And as evidence of that, this is just kind of a cursory thing, but I was looking for um, some kind of holistic views of uh, activism at different campuses. And so I listed some resources here. I encourage you all to look at. Um, it's, of course, not comprehensive. But there's a Tell It How You See It, a living archive post about UC San Diego, how to do their library, um, looking into UC Berkeley's history of activism by the Daily Californian, which is a really interesting profile that the earlier quote from Ruth Rosen came from at UC Santa Barbara, where Eugene and I are situated. Um, there's the AS Living History Project, which is compiling a kind of timeline and histories of student activism, a timeline of a brief history of activism at UCLA from the Daily Bruin. I guess I'm reading these, you can read them, but I'm proud history of UCF's occupations, the incomplete timeline of activism at UC Santa Cruz. So this is the point that there is much activism that's happened across UC campuses, and these are some resources you can look at to sort of familiarize yourself or explore more about those histories. I think the other important part is that, like, what the UC active, activism in UC is so important that it is documented and kept in these archives um, where some of the stuff I was looking at are like scanned newspapers, like living testimonies of people. So that's not only is, is the UC's a site of activism, but it's like crafted and cared for because this the history is so intertwined. Yeah, something that's like actively interrogated and explored at the university. So now some tidbits, just some kind of random things apropos of nothing, but just to give a flavor of some of the different kinds of protests that have happened across UCs. Yeah, so um, Thomas started talking about like what the UCs are known for, activism of Berkeley, Vietnam War, and the, uh, civil, uh, the civil rights era. But um, in 1949, um, kind of before this started, protests against anti-communist loyalty oath um, dem were some of the biggest demonstrations in the country until these 1969 Berkeley protests for People Park. And actually throughout the 30s, um, before this, students were continuously demonstrating against the breakdown of disarmament and the approach of the war. So while we have some big, big, big ticket items, uh, this like activism had been going on in the campus. And the UCs have been seen as like a site and a model of activism. And so now just some later examples. Um, 
1965, for instance, was the first student demonstration ever. It, it, the, sort of at that time recently established UC San Diego and students protested US intervention in the Dominican Republic. In 1968, students at UC Santa Cruz conducted a mass demonstration against Ronald Reagan's campus visit for a meeting of the UC Regents. So again, Reagan's back in the picture and his anti kind of protest rhetoric and anti-Berkeley rhetoric uh, made him very, of course, unpopular among students. In 1969, um, UCLA called cops on the campus for the first time in its history to break up student protests that were going on. This was like a big kind of scandal that there were police being called on a campus. It was unheard of at the time in UCLA. Um, and then in 1991, a group called Escape, which is like a coalition of um, people of color, activists um, and activist groups on UCI campus. They organized a protest in response to a lack of ethnic studies programs on the campus, which began a six year fight for establishing an Asian American studies major. And um, I have a link again in this slide, but uh, an undergraduate student at UC Irvine did a kind of research about this at their library and found that even at the time that there was 42.2% of the population at UC Irvine of the student population was Asian identifying. There was no kind of ethnic studies or Asian American studies department, it was a very prolonged fight to make that a thing, to make a major for it. So wow. just some examples. Kind of thinking about it more broadly, not just about specific events, but maybe about sort of what are some of the motivating factors or what's shaped a lot of UC activism. Um, UC student activists have been fueled across campuses, both by local concerns and kind of broader political aims. So it's that kind of tidbit list we just went over indicated. There were some concerns about curriculum or department offerings that would kind of cause or prompt activism. Um, more big picture kind of global things like war or international politics were also um, often causes to protest. And then of course social issues, um, be they be about sort of racial injustice, gender um, disparities, um, Feminism organizing, so all kinds of things prompted student, have prompted students across UCs to act. And so even as UCs um, students across campuses shared some similar goals, they didn't all come about them or achieve them in the same kind of way. So one example would be the creation of Black Studies Departments. At Berkeley, um, this happened through the Third World Liberation Front, which was a um, collaborative effort between Black Student Union and other um, student of color groups on campus and um, kind of a vision of the university that they saw and that they thought was appropriate um, and needed at that campus. At San Diego, a similar kind of thing happened, but it manifested differently in terms of uh, um, demands that were crafted by the uh, by um, Black and Latinx students that collaborated together to propose a Black Studies Department at UC San Diego. Um, in Santa Barbara, it was achieved through the North Pole takeover, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So these kind of, there are some similar, similar dynamics and similar kinds of groups at play, but across campuses, students felt driven to make these changes and they went about it in the ways that made sense locally. And one thing that's sort of interesting to note, that I'll get into a little bit in the next slide, but specifically at Berkeley and in Santa Barbara, um, groups had tried making formal proposals to administration about black studies departments or other ethnic studies departments that the administration either ignored or diluted um, severely before they kind of passed them. And it was only after sort of kind of hitting a roadblock with official channels, if you will, that um, activists and direct action sort of became the um, mode. So this wasn't like just a complete whatever. It was not an out of nowhere thing that groups were organizing this way. It was a result of the demands they had and the needs they saw that weren't being met and the university's refusal to meet those needs. And kind of another just example of the different ways in which protesting manifested, um, anti-war protests in the Vietnam War era kind of manifested differently in different campuses. Um, there was Peace City at UC Davis, which was kind of an encampment and characterized by like sort of non, um, like a lack of violence in these demonstrations, whereas Berkeley protests were characterized by more violence, both in terms of a more sort of protesting that got called by like Reagan and other politicians like rioting, um, but it also was met by violence by police and sort of militarized responses. And at the same time, a lot of protests at UCSB, it was more sort of mixed, there were a lot of things going on. There was um, anti-violence and more aggressive people at UCSB, but all of the focus of the debate was around the ROTC on UCSB campus. So again, all these campuses, all these students are moved to react to similar situations and have done so in different ways. And so I'll just talk about one example that is relevant to, I mean, it's relevant in general, but Eugene and I specifically have been talking about it just because it's very much tied to our campus context, both being from UC Santa Barbara. 
but in the spring of 1968, as a kind of preface to this thing, so in spring of 1968, as context, the Afro-American Students Union proposed the creation of a Black Studies Department, and the university effectively ignored the proposal. And which is a sort of interesting context and good to know because then October 14th, 1968, members of the Black Student Union carried out a takeover of North Hall um, in response to a set of demands they had, which was motivated by the racism on campus and in the school's athletic program. There were some student athletes who were sort of involved in some of the early stages of planning of this because of racism they experienced, uh, both like literally and sort of like their, um, or not literally, but um, expressly, manifestly in their interactions with coaches or the way they were treated by their teammates, but also differentials in the kind of scholarships they were awarded versus white students. Um, so, as much as this was coming out of a specific um, sort of set of concerns, a lot of the demands that the um, VSU members presented were modeled or had a lot of similarities to the earlier proposals that the um, Afro-American Students Union proposed sort of through official channels. So they were kind of taking out these same concerns um, months later and doing it through this other means. And so to do this, they took a couple of weeks, about two weeks, to plan the takeover of North Hall, which um, it was where the computer center was, the computer mainframe, which the activists had decided or kind of assessed as being the most critical point on campus. It was a computer mainframe was held in North Hall at that time. So they planned for two weeks, which is, makes sense, <laughs> you know, like conduct this kind of thing. But they um, planned about who was be on the outside, kind of doing liaison work. They planned who was gonna be inside, how are they gonna get to the building, how they were gonna clear it out beforehand where all the exits were. So it was a very considered thing and a very good model of sort of how to conduct this kind of um, building to take over. So after 10 hours of occupying the building, the university agreed to seven of the eight demands. And after almost a year of negotiation, the Black Studies Department was created on this campus, which paved the way for Asian American Studies, Chicano and Chicano Studies, and Feminist Studies Departments on campus as well. And this was like, of course, a very um, punctuated account I just gave. Um, they uh, it was a 10 hour demonstration which had pushback from individuals who were trying to kind of break up the protest, but also a lot of support from community members. Um, but it was a very significant moment in UC Santa Barbara's history. And two years ago was the um, 50th year kind of anniversary of it. And so there were a lot of retrospective pieces on it where the activists who were involved in the takeover spoke about it. And it was really instructive because this is, of course, a very like inspiring um, and brave thing they were doing. Which, Kind of taking this building in this way and they talked very frankly about yes of course we were scared there were more people you know in the initial stages who had planned to be a part of it that didn't make it to that day because it was a scary frightening time they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into um and so it was a very kind of nice and frank kind of acknowledgement discussion of some of like the emotional toll and requirements of this so really good pieces links in the notes i would encourage you to read them um but that was all i have for this do you have anything else Eugene? Yeah, I think that just um, highlighting the fact that it was well planned uh, and really using their resources and their community to help support them, right? Like while while these students were inside of the building, really um, taking it over, they had people like point people to do crowd control. They had like white student allies who were there chanting, supporting them. Um, and really using all of their networks to make this happen. So we talk a lot about how activism works, how it happens, if it's spontaneous, is it well planned, like what, what happens between those moments, but this is a good example of what good planning gets you that is, is like well thought out and uses your networks. I think that's important. Yeah, no, completely. So um, to pivot to a more contemporary case study, I'm going to be talking about the Occupy movement. Um, so if you'll recall um, a few weeks ago, I think week three, I think a lot of this kind of connects to that week three when we're talking about austerity measures. Um, the outgrowth of the Occupy movement comes from the 2009 protests in California against tuition, um, against tuition hikes and austerity measures. Um, but in 2011 are connected to larger Occupy goals and beliefs. Um, Occupy Cal, what it was called here, um, was highlighting specifically the failure of the UC Regents in the state of California to honor commitments made in the California Master Plan for Higher Education by giving tuition raises, mandatory furloughs of staff and faculty, the firing of lower ranking workers, and raises for the highest paid administrators. So remember from austerity, not only is it cuts to the bottom, um, to the rank and file, to the workers. It is also giving raises to the elites, 
those who are making these decisions, they're awarding themselves for making other people tighten their belts. And that's what austerity is, and very specifically shown in these Occupy protests. So a quick timeline, and this is not, um, this is not an in-depth expose of Occupy. This is just kind of a couple moments to get us to um, some aftermath. So in November 9th, 2011, you see Berkeley, there was a march in police violence. There were many arrests. Uh, one like a, a faculty member in English was dragged away by her hair. Um, very violent police presence that was was filmed and like on cameras and phones really easily. November 15th, 2011, there's a system wide strikes protests at the uh, California State Universities. And then November 18th, 2011, at UC Davis, Chancellor Katehi says that the tents must be removed. Remember, Occupy was about occupying physical space, starting in Zuccotti Park in New York City, um, but really happening all over the world with tent encampments being the focal point of all of these. So there's a tent encampment at UC Davis, and it had to be removed um, in the words of the chancellor, quote, in the interest of safety, respect for our campus environment, in accordance with our principles of community. So just like bullshit to give you a reason to send in police, thousand um, percent. Part of this, Lieutenant John Pike pepper sprays nonviolent demonstrators, um, which is kind of like the image that comes out of Occupy. Now the next two slides, this is a content warning. Uh, I'm doing, I'm showing a quote from uh, someone who is at the UC Davis um, picket and also showing you the picture um, because I think it, it kind of sets up, the, um, ties together the police violence that Thomas was talking about that like you see the system systematically uses police as part of their like educating system. Like <laughs> the police are here to make sure that we learn. And if we don't, they'll shut it down. So I think that ties into that and also um, ties into the aftermath. So the next two slides, if you want to meet it or just like step away for a minute, uh, when we upload this to YouTube, I'll show this in, in case you don't want to put yourself through this. So quote from Nathan Brown, the assistant professor of English at UC Davis, when students cover their eyes with their clothing, police forced open their mouths and pepper sprayed down their throats. Several of these students were hospitalized. Others are seriously injured. One of them, 45 minutes after being pepper sprayed down his throat, was still coughing up blood. And I think we experienced some of this at Santa Cruz with what happened in Cola, but this is like the epitome of using mace. Learned from the Vietnam War protests um, that Thomas was talking about earlier. Mace was heavily deployed there with police violence. And here's the, the picture um, of uh, Lieutenant Pike uh, spraying protesters nonviolently, not being removed. Um, and on the other side of your screen, you'll see that this is from uh, a communique from 2010, actually before this happened, um, that I just thought was so cool, coming out of the tuition protests of the places where all of these um, protests are happening and showing all of the prisons. Um, in California with dollar signs that like, shows a longer history of incarceration um, in, in California. Maybe we'll talk about that one, who knows, Thomas. Um, all right, you're back, you can come back and listen. Um, so the aftermath of this, right, that was, that, why we're showing that picture and why Davis matters here is because um, UC owed, it, owed money to them after this. Um, there was a suit and the UC was required to pay $30,000 to each of these 21 protesters all of whom were students who were um, part not, uh, like that were um, sprayed with pepper spray. And the UC would also pay $250,000 to cover their attorney's fees and their costs to assist with applying for records adjustment and students who were negatively affected. Um, Pike was suspended um, with pay afterward um, and received a workers' comp um, settlement in 2016. Um, he earned $120,000 a year at that point. Um, just an aside. Um, after this, there was an inquiry into the events by UC President Mark Udoff, which found excessive force by police. Did you know? I was shocked. Um, Riveting kind of conclusion. Right? Um, and part of the findings were that these, um, this excessive force by police against students and demonstrators were said to be part of a larger pattern observed within the state of California and across the United States. Um, the board that was investigating this said that the police violence was used against nonviolent demonstrators at UC Davis, UCLA, UC Berkeley, and at a Cal State Board of Trustees meeting in Long Beach. 
So really did a full scale study of what was happening during Occupy. Um, then <laughs> uh, UC Davis uses public money given to them through the state legislature and, and, um, and through their own money to eradicate references to the pepper spray incident to scrub the picture from the internet and to remove negative results, search results for Katehi, the chancellor. Um, <laughs> more than $175,000 in contracts um, to address this university song and reputation, which they said was super important to get people to go there again. All this money they're spending on this, they could have just given everyone colas. <laughs> oh, no. It's all there. No. Yeah. Um, and from Assemblyman Kevin McCarthy, it is troubling that the administration chose to spend scarce public dollars and to nearly double its PR budget when tuition soared, course offerings were slashed, and California risen students were being shut out. Remember, this is after the 2008 recession, after you just had people protesting tuition hikes, and they're doing this bullshit, which I'm sure, like, is probably, they just, UC Davis just got found out. I'm sure this happens elsewhere. I mean, I, all these chancellors, sorry. Uh, so Katehi resigns in 2016. Because of this, which um, the Chancellor Napolitano originally was like, oh, but she means well, it's okay. And then later had to be like, actually you have to resign. Because she was also found to be part of the board of DeVry University, a for-profit university, um, where she was getting on top of her $400,000 a year salary, $420,000 from stocks and bonds income for 2012 to 2014, which was just two years. She, um, depending on how long she was part of that board, um, was longer. So yeah, she had to resign, but she's still, she was still a faculty after that. And I don't know if she still is. Um, but yeah, Whew. get all grumpy about this. <laughs> you see money stuff. It's just like, come on. Um, and yeah, like re recall when Thomas was talking about this, like week two or three, like they they were having you see regions of lavish dinners, like celebrating that they're increasing tuition raises. Like this is just part and parcel of what we experience here. So at the end of this activism, and again, this is just kind of a broad brush. We're not getting into a lot of the details, but going into the future, we're gonna get a cola, baby. Uh, I think we like what, what we've done to get to this moment has been a lot of great work. And I think that, I think we will get it. It's not now. It's, we're in the middle of something bigger, but I think that's part that's we continue to fight to that. And our UAW contract expires in 2022 when we can get back to the negotiation table. Um, there's also currently a telescope being built at Mauna Kea in Hawaii um, on indigenous land that the UC is funding, and there are calls for divestment. Um, uh, this is also important, I think. Um, Betsy DeVos just released some new um, information about Title IX reports going forward. And like, you know what's gonna happen? No one's gonna report sexual assaults anymore because of like the bullshit that she just signed the law. So like, uh, Increased so protections for those accused of sexual assault. Yeah, yeah. And, and then public and hearings. Drama. Public hearings for the people, like it's just, like, She's whatever. They're all fucking ghouls. She's a devil. I hate this. Yeah. So like that's I think this is something we're gonna have to like continue to do, especially like universities are sites of sexual assault um, and rape, and it's like and so this is something we're gonna have to continue to think about. Affinity group organizing. So in the context of activism, affinity groups are like your close friends, a group that you're uh, aligning with to do actions. In uh, UC Talk, affinity groups are like identity-based organizations. So Thomas and I are both part of the queer grads. That is our affinity group that we organize with. Um, and I think um, at, the, at UCSB, we can see that they have a history of uh, these affinity groups organizing, like the Black Student um, Union, to get, um, to get things passed, which are important. And then, if Cole has taught us nothing, it's solidarity for all workers. Um, that we started with graduate students, but really, and I mean through all of this uh, research that we've been doing, it's like workers should come first and having solidarity with all workers, regardless of where they're at, is important. And oh, then yeah. on a much more, we have like this very nice things Eugene outlined about the reality of our future. And then I have like a frantic rant. Um, so <laughs> uh, it was so interesting and like important to talk about this kind of history of activism across the UCs because our past affects our future and our vision for the future is part of the dreams of activists through history. 
And so looking at all these things we were talking about this week, first of all, the sort of through line of police violence and state violence that's been so tied um, to responses to protests in the UCs is very much like certainly not divorced from the history of settler colonialism and forcible removal of land that we kind of started this with talking about um, the unceded territory that we're all basically living in and learning on. But also, and so and that's sort of a negative, whatever category, obviously, but then on a sort of more positive or brighter note, just looking at the ways in which students across UC campuses have organized to affect change and to fight for sort of a more just vision of the world and have done it in their own ways is like really interesting and inspiring. And that's what makes Strike You partly so exciting and it's uh, invigorating for us to be a part of because this is a cross, a, a cross UC effort where we kind of get to see what different people's sort of strengths and expertises are across campuses and that can all come together on one kind of unified front. So hopefully we can look at this and think about this legacy of activism and the ways in which it's been disproportionately um, sort of black and brown folks who've had to do some of the hardest kind of lifting and action um, to affect change that we are able to benefit from and hopefully learn from and be mindful of as we organize and continue to organize in our own spaces. Um, uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, that's so great, Thomas. Thank you. And then, guess what? You learned a couple minutes ago that me and Eugene were both in the queer grads group. That's right. We are part of the LGBTQIA plus community, Hanny. So next week, what are we doing? Um, we're taking it in a sort of different direction than we've been looking. We basically taught all of the history of the UCs at this point. There's kind of like nothing left. We've turned every stone. So now we're kind of taking a different direction and we're going to look at HIV AIDS and COVID-19 and think about these kind of pandemics together and apart and what they mean to each other and maybe it'll just be two queer grads, uh, <laughs> not that other I was going to say, uh, mediating on um, kind of our positionalities but hopefully it'll be interesting exciting. Eugene, anything else? Uh, just that thanks for watching, you're great. Uh, yeah. Like, comment, subscribe. I don't know. Is that what people say? <laughs> comment below. I think I should. <laughs> Click the bell icon so you know whenever we have a new video. Like if you want to see us do a cover of Dua Lipa. And comment if you want to see us do a cover of Lana Del Rey in our next video. Thanks. <laughs> love you. Click subscribe and follow. That's it. We can stop. Please. Please end it. <laughs>